followed my wife and found out she was on a date with another man. So I planned my sweet revenge. Hey Reddit, my name is Xander, and I've got a story that I never thought I'd have to tell. It's about my family, or at least the family I thought I had. Up until a few months ago, if anyone had asked me, I'd have said we were picture perfect. I lived in this snug, warm house on the outskirts of Boise, Idaho with my wife Kalea, our daughter Elodie, who's 12, and a hyper little beagle named Sparky. I'm talking about a life straight out of those TV shows where everyone gets along. You know, the kind of life that has you grinning at the thought of coming home. That was us, or so it seemed. Kalia was the kind of woman who lit up the room, always organizing block parties or baking something delicious. Elidi, with her wild curls and big questioning eyes, was as smart as they come, glued to her books and full of hugs for her old man. Sparky, well, he was the little furball that never failed to make us laugh, always getting into some kind of mischief. We were a team, the three of us and the dog, against whatever life threw our way. Or, that's what I was led to believe. I was the guy who'd come home from work every day, throw a lady into the air as she laughed and then wrap Kalea in a hug that said, I'm so glad to be back here with you. We had it all figured out and life was good. But here's where it gets messy, folks. One evening, things started to unravel. I was looking for the pizza place's number on Kelly's phone because, you know, Friday night is pizza night. It's a sacred tradition in our house. But I stumbled upon something that was definitely not about pizza. There, popping out like a sore thumb amidst the usual texts about groceries and school pickups, were these messages from a guy named Jax. His texts were littered with heart emojis, the winky faces, and some stuff that made my stomach do backflips. I felt like I'd been punched in the goot. I just stood there, frozen, the phone heavy in my hand. Was I really seeing this? Kalia, with her laughter that filled our home, the mother of my child, sending hearts to some dude named Jax? It couldn't be right. Maybe it was a joke, a misunderstanding, a prank. I didn't want to believe it. I mean, who wants to believe that their sunshine is actually a storm waiting to happen? Hey everyone. Unfortunately, basically everyone who is watching these videos isn't subscribed. It would mean the world to me to quickly get out of the full screen video for three seconds and press that subscribe button. It's free and you can unsubscribe anytime. Sorry for bothering and thank you so much if you subscribed. So, I put the phone down, the number for pizza long forgotten. I tried to act normal, but inside I was a mess of questions and doubts. I watched Kelia and Elidi, wondering if I was just being paranoid. But the images of those messages wouldn't leave my mind. It was like a dark cloud had settled over our little house and suddenly it didn't feel so cozy anymore. I needed answers, but I was scared to ask the questions. So there I was, playing pretend in my own life, smiling through a dinner where every laugh felt like a lie. And that, dear friends, was the beginning of the end of the happy family that never was. After the pizza night debacle, I spent the weekend wrestling with my thoughts, trying to piece together the puzzle that was suddenly my life. I was like a detective in one of those old noir films, except the case was my own marriage. It felt surreal, you know? By Sunday evening, the weight of those messages was like a lead vest, and I knew I had to clear the air. So, I braced myself and confronted Kalea. I remember my hands were shaking when I asked her about Jax. She just looked at me, her eyes wide with what I mistook for surprise. Then she laughed. Not the warm laugh that usually filled our home, but something sharp and quick. She told me Jax was just a friend from her yoga class, someone who made her laugh. You're being ridiculous, Xander, she said, shaking her head like I was a little kid who'd said something silly. I wanted to believe her, Reddit. I really did. But there was something off in her smile, something that didn't reach her eyes. I tried to convince myself that it was all in my head. Kalia was my wife, the love of my life, the mother of my daughter. Friends send each other emojis, right? Nothing to lose sleep over. But then, there was Elodie. My little girl, who'd always been daddy's biggest fan, started giving me the cold shoulder. She was whispering with her mom, giving me these long, searching looks that made me feel like I was on trial in my own home. Every time I walked into the room, their conversation would stop. 
whisper, 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 and then silence when I showed up. What really got to me was how she started locking her phone. This was the kid who used to beg me to play games on it, who didn't have a single secret. Now, all of a sudden, her phone was Fort Knox and I wasn't allowed in. The air in the house changed. It was like walking into a room where the floor might disappear at any moment. I felt like an outsider, like I'd stumbled into the wrong story and couldn't find the exit. Was I just being paranoid? That word kept spinning in my head, paranoid. I started second guessing everything. Maybe Kalea was right. Maybe I was just being ridiculous. Every laugh, every whisper, every look, they all became clues. But clues to what? The worst part, Reddit, was the silence. The silence when I asked how their day was and got nothing but mumbles in return. The silence when I tried to hug Kalia and she gently pushed me away, saying she was tired or not feeling well. The silence in my head when I tried to convince myself that everything was okay. I started to doubt my own thoughts, my own feelings. I'd look in the mirror, and instead of seeing Xander, the loving husband and father, I saw a stranger, a man who didn't know his own wife and kid anymore. It was like standing on a bridge, watching the water below, and not knowing if you jumped whether you'd swim or sink. Hey again, Reddit. So, where were we? Ah yes, in the thick of my own personal soap opera. I wish I could tell you things got better, but life's not in the habit of handing out fairy tale twists. I remember it was a Thursday night when I overheard that conversation, the one that turned the nagging doubts into screaming alarms. I was coming back inside from taking out the trash when I heard their voices floating down from Elidi's bedroom window. I should have walked away, but I was drawn to the sound like a moth to a flame. You should be with who makes you happy, Mom, Elidi said, her voice serious and more grown up than I'd ever heard it. Those words felt like a gut punch. This wasn't some random pep talk. This was my daughter giving her blessing to what seemed like the dismantling of our family. I stood there frozen as the cold Idaho night air bit at my skin. Happy, she said, the irony of it twisted in my chest. Here I was, trying to keep Uzal happy by playing the part of the clueless husband. A few days later, the second domino fell. I was on our home computer when I noticed it running slower than usual. Being the semi-tech savvy dad that I am, I decided to do some digital cleaning. Kalea's email was logged in, she must have forgotten to log out. And there it was, a folder marked, work stuff. Innocent enough, but the universe has a sick sense of humor. Curiosity got the best of me, and I clicked. Work stuff? Not unless her job included exchanging love letters and cozy photos with Jax, whose face was now more familiar to me than my own reflection. Each email was a hammer building a coffin for our marriage. My dearest Kalia, I long for the next time we're together. You are my true happiness. I couldn't breathe. There it was, the life I didn't know, laid bare in pixelated confessionals and JPEG secrets. My heart raced. A mix of anger and heartbreak churned in my stomach. Confrontation was inevitable. This time, I had proof, solid and undeniable. So I faced Kalea with her own words, the emails printed out and laid between us like a challenge. But she was a fortress. She denied it all, with a fire in her eyes that I'd never seen before. She accused me of invading her privacy, of being a control freak. Don't you trust me, Xander? She spat, as if I was the one who had brought strangers into our marriage. She turned my world upside down, making me feel guilty for uncovering the truth. And for a moment, a fleeting, weak moment, I doubted myself. I wondered if I was the villain in her story, the bad guy who snooped and pried and broke the sacred trust between man and wife. But no, Reddit, I wasn't the bad guy. I was just the guy who couldn't see the wool that had been pulled over his eyes. The guy who believed in a happy family portrait, not realizing it was drawn with disappearing ink. The stage was set, the players were ready, and the lies, oh, the lies were just beginning to unravel. I told Kalia I had a business trip, a last minute deal that couldn't wait, real important stuff. 
She kissed me goodbye with that same detached peck that had become the norm. And a lady. She barely glanced up from her phone to wave me off. As I drove away, I could see Kalia's silhouette at the window, phone already in hand. My gut twisted. I didn't head to the airport. Instead, I parked a street over in my buddy's beat-up Camaro. There I was, slouched in the driver's seat, baseball cap pulled low, heart thumping in my chest. It felt like a stakeout in my own life, which is about as messed up as it sounds. Hours ticked by and doubt started to eat at me. What if I was wrong? What if those messages and emails were just... What? A fantasy? A joke? But then, as the afternoon sun began to dip, painting the Boise sky in shades of fire, I saw them. Kalea walked out, dressed up like it was date night. But the date wasn't with me. Moments later, Jax appeared, that too familiar stranger. My breath hitched as they met on the sidewalk, laughing about something I couldn't hear, couldn't be a part of. Their hands found each other, and that's when my heart didn't just break, it shattered. They were headed to Luciano's, the kind of place with cloth napkins and a wait list, the kind of place we'd saved for anniversaries and whispered sweet nothings over candlelight. I followed at a distance, the Camaro's engine a low growl beneath the city sounds. From a parking spot across the street, I watched them through the restaurant window. They picked a table, our table, near the back with a view of the park. When Jax kissed her hand across the white tablecloth, it was like watching a scene from someone else's life. Only I knew all the lines. I wanted to storm in there, to flip tables and demand answers. But I didn't. I sat there, a silent spectator to my own tragedy, fury boiling over, hands clenched so tight my knuckles turned white. It was real. All of it. The lies, the sneaking around, the betrayal. It was as tangible as the leather of the steering wheel beneath my grip. Living in a bad dream? No. This was worse. In dreams you wake up, there's relief. But there was no waking up from this, no escape from the sting of betrayal. It seared through me hot and fierce, leaving me to smolder in the wreckage of what I once thought was a happy life. And there, parked in shadows with a heart full of lead, I realized the depth of the lie I'd been living. This wasn't an accident, it wasn't a mistake, it was a choice, her choice. And it tortured everything. You'd think after the stakeout stunt, I'd have had enough drama to last a lifetime. But there's something about getting sucker punched by life. You either lie down and take it, or you stand up and start swinging. So, I went for round two, with the truth clenched in my fists. I waited until the next day, after the images had seared into my brain, turning every thought into a live wire. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, couldn't look at Kalia without seeing her laughing it up with Jax. When I confronted her, it was with a phone full of pictures, evidence that was as clear as daylight. This time, there was no room for denial, no corner to twist the truth into something else. I held up my phone, the photos glaring back at us in the quiet of our kitchen. You and Jax, I said, voice steady as a drumbeat. At Luciano's, at our table. I watched her, waiting for the mask to slip, for the lies to crumble. Kalia's face went through a gallery of emotions, shock, fear, anger, until it settled on something that looked like sorrow. Xander, she whispered, and there was a tremor in her voice, the first note of realness I'd heard in months. She broke down then, tears spilling over, hands shaking. The affair wasn't news anymore, but the why. It was a gut punch. You changed, Xander. You stopped being fun. You got so serious and dull. Jax, he's exciting. He makes me feel alive. It was as if she'd handed me the blame, gift-wrapped, like I was the one who'd pushed her into someone else's arms. I stood there, dumbfounded, anger boiling into rage. Then, Elidi. She'd been a silent shadow in the hallway, but at her mother's cry, she burst in like a summer storm. Dad, how could you? She screamed, her little face twisted in anger. You made mom unhappy, you're a liar. My own kid, my little girl, looked at me like I was the monster under the bed, the villain in the story. The world fell away. It was just her words, stabbing at me, each one a verdict of guilt. 
I wanted to reach out to her, to explain, to make her see. But she was past listening. There it was, my family, a house of cards in a windstorm. The confrontation I'd thought would be the end was just another beginning, a twisted path into a thicket of blame and hurt. I was the husband who'd lost his wife to a fantasy, the father whose daughter had turned against him, the man who thought he could fix things, only to find that some breaks can't be mended. So, Reddit, I laid it all out and what did it get me? A broken heart, a daughter who thinks I'm the bad guy, and a home that felt like a war zone. I had stepped into the ring expecting a fight, but I wasn't ready for this kind of battle. The kind where even when you're right, you're wrong. The kind where the ground falls out from beneath you and you're just falling with nothing to grab onto. After the shouting had faded and the house had settled into a heavy silence, I was left alone with the shattered pieces of what used to be my life. That night, I lay in the darkness, the scenes of betrayal looping in my head like some twisted highlight reel. By the time dawn broke, painting a pale streak of light across the room, I'd made up my mind. No more Mr. Nice Guy, no more Xander the doormat. It was time for action, time to hit back. First things first, money. It always comes down to money, doesn't it, Reddit? I logged into our online banking with a grim sort of determination. My fingers didn't even hesitate as I transferred the bulk of our savings into a new account, just my name on it this time. Next were the credit cards, snip snip, all of Kalia's cards cut off. She wouldn't be whining and dining with Jax on my dime, not anymore. But that was just financial foreplay. The main event was Jax, or more specifically, his unsuspecting wife. How do you tell a stranger that their life's about to implode? There's no good way, no hallmark card for this kind of news. I found her through social media, a smiling picture of her with Jax, Hashtagged Aitsaisaishan soulmates. The irony wasn't lost on me. I called her, heart pounding like a drum solo, and asked if we could meet. She sounded puzzled, but agreed. We picked a neutral place, a coffee shop, where the baristas were too busy to eavesdrop. Sitting across from her, I felt like I was holding a grenade with the pin already pulled. I took a deep breath and laid it all out the emails, the photos, the late night whispers. She listened her face going from confusion to horror to a kind of numb resignation. I watched her world crumble, saw the pain in her eyes and something in me fractured. What was I doing? Was I serving justice or just spreading the pain? But there was no going back. I'd opened Pandora's box and all the dark things flew out wild and uncontrollable. She thanked me with a voice that was barely a whisper and walked away. I don't know what happened to her after, but I knew I'd set fire to Jax's life just as surely as he'd help torch mine. I drove home that day feeling like an avenging angel, cold and righteous, but as the adrenaline faded, doubt crept in. I'd struck back, but at what cost? Kalia's world was shaken, sure, but so was Elite's. And Jax's wife, another victim in a game she didn't even know she was playing. Revenge is a strange thing, Reddit. It's bitter and sharp and it spreads like wildfire, burning everything it touches, leaving you wondering if the ashes were worth the warmth. So there I was, the architect of my own vengeance, standing in the ruins of what I'd destroyed, not sure if I felt like a hero or a villain. But one thing was certain, there was no going back. The die was cast, the cards were on the table, and the game, the game had just begun. The first domino to fall was Jack's, Turns out, Jax's wife was not the kind to cry into her pillow. She was a warrior, a woman of action. She marched right up to Kalea's company and dropped the bomb about the affair, complete with the emails and photos I had given her. The company had a strict policy against fraternizing, especially the married people having affairs kind of fraternizing. Jax was out of a job faster than you can say scandal. The news of his job loss spread like a virus through our social circles. People I hadn't spoken to in months were texting me, asking if I knew if I was okay. I wasn't. I was the farthest thing from okay. Kalia was livid. The day she found out, she came at me like a hurricane, her words laced with venom. You've destroyed everything, Xander, she screamed, her face red, her hands balled into fists at her side. You're a vindictive, spiteful, 
the names she called me would have made a sailor blush. But worse than Kalia's fury was Elidi's silence. She wouldn't look at me, wouldn't speak to me. She moved around the house like a ghost, her eyes hollow, her voice gone. She'd been my chatty, bubbly girl, and now, nothing. I might as well have been transparent. Once, when I tried to talk to her, to explain why I did what I did, she just shook her head and said, you broke us, Dad. You broke everything. And then she walked away. That hurt more than any shouting match with Kalea. My daughter, my heart, looking at me like I was the bad guy. Like I'd will fully detonated our family life just for the heck of it. So there I was, Reddit, the man who had pulled the thread that unraveled the tapestry of his own life. I'd wanted justice, or maybe it was revenge, I'm still not sure. What I got was a lonely house and a ticket to Pariahville. It's strange how you can be surrounded by people and yet feel utterly alone. That was me. I was the man in the eye of the hurricane, watching as the winds tore everything apart. I'd started this chain reaction thinking I would come out the other side feeling vindicated, feeling right. Instead, I felt empty. There's no glory in being the agent of chaos in your own story, no matter how justified you think you are. There's just the fallout, and fallout, as I learned, sticks to you long after the bomb has gone off. As the days turned to weeks and the drama refused to quiet down, I did what I thought I'd never do. I filed for divorce. It was a word that tasted like ash in my mouth, a word that, once spoken, couldn't be taken back. The papers were stark, the black ink on white paper spelling out the end of a once beautiful chapter. When it came to Elidi, my shining star, I wanted her with me. I wanted to fight for her, to pull her out of the crossfire and into safety. But when we sat down in those stuffy offices with lawyers who spoke in sterile terms, Elidi's voice was quiet but firm. I want to stay with mom. It cut deeper than any betrayal. Kalia had cheated, lied, and broken our vows, but Elodie... Elodie still saw her as home. So I moved out. I left the house with a bag of clothes and a heart so heavy I could barely carry it. I found a small apartment on the other side of Boise, a place with bare walls and a view of the parking lot. It was a far cry from the home I'd built with laughter and dreams. I'd sit there at night, the silence deafening, and wonder if any of it was worth it. The truth had not set me free, it had put me in a different kind of prison, one with bars made of memories and what-ifs. I missed Elidi fiercely, every single day. I'd reach for my phone to send her a message to try and bridge the gulf between us, only to remember her words and let it fall back into my pocket. Sometimes I'd drive by the house, slowing down just enough to catch a glimpse of the life I'd left behind. I'd see Elidi through the window, and my heart would lurch. But I never stopped never got out, because she wasn't mine to hold on to anymore, not really. And so, Reddit, here I am, the guy who blew up his life in search of something like justice. I sit in my apartment filled with secondhand furniture and wonder if it was worth it. The truth? It's a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways, and nobody wins in the end. The cost of truth was high, too high. It cost me my daughter's laughter my wife's touch the joy of being a family. I'm left wondering if ignorance is bliss, or if the IG of knowledge is the price. We pay for some deeper, sadder wisdom. I guess the moral of my story is this. The truth will set you free, sure, but it'll tear everything else down in the process. And once everything you love is rubble at your feet, freedom feels a lot like being lost. As I adjusted the rearview mirror, the familiar skyscrapers of our old city faded in the distance. Ahead, the scenic beauty of our new town beckoned, with lush trees waving in greeting. The shift in scenery mirrored the fresh start I felt deep within. The job transfer had been unexpected, but sometimes life's surprises are its best gifts. Sarah and I had always dreamt of a peaceful life away from the hustle and bustle. When the job offer came in, with its promise of a better position and a significant pay raise, it felt like the universe was listening. Here's to new beginnings, Sarah had whispered in my ear, her excitement infectious. Finding a house was the next big step. We skipped the cliched streets and settled on Maple Lane, 
Our new home was a charming little place with a backyard garden where I envisioned weekend barbecues and twilight tea sessions. It wasn't just a house. It felt like home. Our neighbors seemed friendly, often sharing a warm hello or a wave, making us feel welcomed. One lazy Sunday, as we lounged around, Sarah pinched her side playfully. Dave, she said with mock exasperation, we've been indulging a bit too much, haven't we? I think it's time I hit the gym. I grinned. You're always beautiful to me. But I could see the earnestness behind her light tone. I wanted her to feel her best, to find her place and joy in this new setting. After some research, I stumbled upon Peak Fitness. It was top rated and not far from home. Without a second thought, I got her a membership. I imagined it would be a good outlet for her, maybe even a place to make new friends. I surprised her with the membership card the next day, watching as her eyes widened in delight. Oh, Dave, this is wonderful. Thank you, she said, wrapping her arms around me. As days turned into weeks, Sarah's gym tales became a regular part of our dinner conversations. She'd speak animatedly about her workouts, the new faces, and her experiences. It felt good to see her so happy, but little did I know that this very decision, meant to be a simple act of love, would soon change the course of our lives in ways I could never have imagined. The Handsome Coach One evening, as I was organizing some papers in our study, I overheard Sarah chatting animatedly on the phone with her friend, Monica. You won't believe the new coach at Peak Fitness, Mon, she giggled. He's like one of those models from a fitness magazine cover. Intrigued, I couldn't help but listen in a bit more. Sarah rarely talked about people this way. He's incredibly tall, has chiseled features, and you should see those muscles. Every time he walks into the room, everyone just stares. I chuckled to myself. It seemed like Sarah had a mini celebrity in her gym. She continued, his name's Alex. You remember Jenna from the morning batch? She nearly dropped her weights today when he corrected her posture. It was heartening to hear Sarah so spirited. The move had been challenging and hearing her so animated about a small gym crush felt endearing. Little harmless gym talk, I mused. The following week, Sarah seemed even more enthusiastic about her workouts. Alex gave me some great tips today, she beamed one evening, her eyes shining. He thinks I have potential, and if I'm interested, He's open to giving me personal training sessions. I hesitated for a split second. That's great, isn't it? I said, trying to sound enthusiastic. Just be careful not to overdo it. Sarah caught the hint of concern in my voice. Oh, Dave, it's not like that, she said, playfully nudging me. It's just professional. Besides, think about how toned I'll be for our beach vacation next month. But as the days passed, Sarah began talking about Alex more frequently their workout sessions, the healthy diet he recommended, the jokes he cracked, it started becoming a regular part of our conversations. One evening, she showed me a video on her phone of her achieving a new fitness milestone with Alex cheering her on in the background. Look at that, I couldn't have done it without him, she gushed. I tried to brush off the uneasy feeling brewing within me. After all, Sarah was just excited about her fitness journey, right? Yet, I couldn't shake off the growing sense of unease every time his name was mentioned. Was it just innocent admiration, or was there something more lurking beneath the surface? The First Suspicions Over the next few weeks, I noticed subtle changes in our routines. The woman who once loved lazy mornings now jumped out of bed with a zeal I hadn't seen in years. Sarah's workout outfits grew trendier, and there was a new perfume she wore, one that I hadn't gifted her. One evening, I planned a surprise dinner for us. I cooked her favorite pasta and lit some candles. As the clock ticked past our usual dinner time, I found myself constantly glancing at the door. Sarah finally walked in almost two hours late, her face flushed and her hair disheveled. Oh, Dave, I lost track of time at the gym. Alex was showing me some advanced moves, she said, sounding genuinely sorry. Trying to hide my disappointment, I served the now cold dinner. It wasn't just the late nights. There were now secretive phone calls, too. I'd often enter a room to find Sarah quickly ending a call or tilting her phone away. Just gym stuff, she'd brush off when I asked. One Saturday morning, as I was fixing a leaky tap in our bathroom, Sarah's phone buzzed continuously on the counter. Curiosity getting the better of me, I glanced at the screen. 
There were several new messages, all from Alex. Most were about workouts, but a few were different, personal. You looked great in that new outfit today, one of them read. A storm of emotions whirled inside me, anger, confusion, disbelief. But more than anything, I felt a pang of betrayal. I convinced myself that maybe I was reading too much into it. It was just a compliment, right? A few days later, my good friend Mike invited me for a drink. As we settled into our booth, he hesitated, then said, Look, Dave, I don't want to stir things up, but I've seen Sarah and Alex together a couple of times at this new cafe downtown. They looked cozy. My heart sank. Mike continued, I thought you should know, mate. I mean, it might be nothing, but it didn't sit right with me. As I drove home that night, my mind raced. Was Sarah just making a new friend, or was there something more to her bond with Alex? My trust in our relationship, once unwavering, now wobbled on shaky ground. The love of my life, my partner in everything, seemed to be slowly slipping away, and I felt powerless to stop it. The Secret Meeting Over the next week, my thoughts were consumed by what Mike had told me. Every time Sarah left for the gym, a knot tightened in my stomach. I found myself distracted at work, replaying her interactions with Alex in my mind. Was I being paranoid, or was I missing blatant signs? One afternoon, I got an idea. What if I just happened to run into them at the cafe Mike mentioned? I could see for myself what was going on and maybe put my fears to rest. The following day, I left work early and drove to the cafe. Securing a hidden spot near the back, I settled in with a newspaper, peeking over the top every so often. The minutes turned into an hour, and I was just about to leave when they walked in, Sarah and Alex. My heart raced as I watched them from behind my newspaper shield. They chose a corner table, laughing about something. It wasn't the friendly banter between a coach and trainee. There was an intimacy to it that made my skin crawl. Their hands occasionally brushed against each other as they talked, and their laughter seemed just a little too personal. At one point, Alex whispered something into Sarah's ear, making her blush deeply. That image, of them so close, felt like a dagger in my chest. Doubt and disbelief warred within me. I wanted to storm over, to confront them then and there, but something held me back. Maybe it was the fear of causing a scene or the hope that I was still misinterpreting the situation. I needed more concrete evidence. Slipping out of the cafe, I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. The drive home was a blur. I entered our home, my home, with a heavy heart, trying to keep a facade of normalcy. Sarah was her usual self, talking about her day, completely oblivious to the fact that I knew about her secret rendezvous. That night, as she slept peacefully next to me, I lay awake, lost in my thoughts. The woman I loved was keeping secrets, and I was left grappling with the reality of our crumbling relationship. I needed to know the truth, no matter how painful. It was time for a confrontation. The Discovery As the days passed, the atmosphere in our home grew tenser. My smiles were strained, and conversations became curt. Sarah sensed it, I could tell, but neither of us addressed the looming cloud of suspicion. One evening, I couldn't hold it in any longer. I know about the cafe, Sarah, I blurted out as we sat down for dinner. Her eyes widened in surprise, her fork halfway to her mouth. What do you mean? She stammered, trying to feign innocence. I saw you, with Alex, laughing, whispering, getting cozy, I said, my voice shaking with a mix of anger and despair. Sarah looked taken aback. Dave, it's not what you think. We're just friends. But I wasn't convinced. Friends. Since when do friends have secret meetings and whisper sweet nothings? Sarah took a deep breath, her eyes glistening with tears. I didn't tell you because I knew you'd react this way, but it's truly innocent. We have coffee sometimes after our sessions. That's it. However, the growing pile of evidence in my mind refused to accept her explanation. Then explain the text, Sarah, the secretive phone calls, the change in your behavior. She looked down, playing with her food. After a long pause, she finally spoke. All right, there's something you should know. She walked over to a drawer and pulled out a sleek folder. Handing it over, she said, open it. Curiously, I flipped it open. 
Inside were detailed plans for a new fitness center, brochures, and a business proposal. The title read, Revive Fitness, A New Horizon in Wellness and Training. I looked up at her, puzzled. What's this? Sarah took a deep breath. Alex approached me with a business proposal a few weeks ago. He wanted to start a new fitness center, and he thought I'd be a great partner, given my passion and knack for management. We were working on this together, Dave. That's what the meetings were about. It was all business. I was dumbstruck. All the pieces of the puzzle suddenly fit, but in a way, I hadn't expected. The realization hit me hard. My suspicions, my accusations, all were rooted in a grave misunderstanding. But why keep it a secret? I whispered. She sighed. I wanted it to be a surprise, a venture of our own, something we could look forward to. But I realize now I should have been transparent with you. We sat in silence, the weight of my accusations and her revelations hanging heavily between us. The path ahead seemed uncertain, but one thing was clear. Trust, once broken, would take time to rebuild. The Confrontation The revelation about the business venture left me reeling. I was torn between feeling relieved that my wife wasn't having an affair and the guilt of having doubted her in the first place. I had let jealousy and suspicion cloud my judgment, and the aftermath of that was a gulf of distance between Sarah and me. A few nights later, Sarah and I sat in the dimly lit living room, the only sound being the rhythmic ticking of the wall clock. There was so much I wanted to say, to apologize for, but words failed me. Dave, we can't go on like this, Sarah began, her voice barely above a whisper. You need to trust me. I do, Sarah, I truly do. I just, when I saw you with him, laughing, sharing secrets, I felt replaced, left out. Sarah's face crumpled. I never meant to make you feel that way, but you should have talked to me, not jumped to conclusions. She was right, but another nagging thought remained. Why Alex, Sarah, of all people? Why get involved with him? Sarah looked away for a moment, collecting her thoughts. He's good at what he does, Dave, and he saw potential in our partnership. It was purely professional, but I wasn't ready to let go. You must have seen how he acted, the messages he sent. They weren't just professional. Sarah sighed. He did get a bit friendly, maybe even flirty, but I kept it strictly about business. I set boundaries. I rubbed my temples, trying to process everything. You should have told me. About the flirty texts about everything, instead of keeping secrets. Sarah nodded, tears in her eyes. I know. I should have. But I didn't want to worry you, or make you think it was something it wasn't. Before we could continue, there was a sudden knock on the door. I opened it to find Alex, looking a bit disheveled and holding a bouquet of flowers. Is Sarah here? I wanted to apologize for the misunderstandings and hope we can continue with the project, he said, a little too confidently. Seeing him at our doorstep was the last straw for me. You've done enough, I snapped, anger surging through me. Stay away from my wife and stay away from this house. Alex seemed taken aback. Look, I get it, you're upset, but I never intended to come between you two. We have a potentially successful venture at hand. Let's not ruin it over personal differences. Sarah stepped forward, her voice firm. Alex, the project is on hold until further notice, and for the sake of professionalism, I'd prefer if our future meetings are kept within business hours and at the office. Alex looked between us, the weight of the situation finally settling in. All right, he said, defeated. I hope we can sort this out soon. He left the bouquet by the doorstep and retreated. Closing the door, Sarah and I turned to face each other. We were both at a crossroads, grappling with feelings of betrayal and misunderstanding. The future of our relationship hung in the balance, and only time would tell if we could find our way back to each other. The plan days turned into weeks, and while the air between Sarah and me was still thick with tension, there was an underlying desire to rebuild what had been shaken. We both felt it, even if neither of us said it aloud. We began attending couples therapy, which provided us a platform to air our grievances and work through the mistrust. One evening, 
After a particularly emotional therapy session, I sat at our kitchen island, going over bills and household accounts. I stumbled across a credit card statement, one I wasn't familiar with. Curiosity peaked. I went through the charges. There were several large amounts credited to a company named Revive Ventures. My heart sank. It was related to the fitness center project. Sarah, I called out hesitantly, holding up the statement. She walked in, glanced at the paper, and took a deep breath. I used our joint savings for the initial payments for the center. I thought it would be a profitable venture for us. I wish you had discussed this with me first, I replied, trying to keep my voice even. Sarah's face was a mix of guilt and desperation. I know, Dave. I messed up. But we can't back out now. We stand to lose everything. A heavy silence settled between us. The weight of our decisions, both spoken and unspoken, pressed down on us. I have an idea, I began slowly, my mind racing. What if we take control of this project? Ensure that it becomes the success you envisioned. But this time, we do it together. Sarah looked up, hope glimmering in her eyes for the first time in weeks. How? We get involved in every aspect of it. From the layout of the gym, to the training programs, to marketing. And most importantly, we set clear boundaries with Alex. Sarah nodded, determination setting in. We can do this, together. Over the next few days, we dived into the project headfirst. We researched competitors, drew up marketing plans, and brainstormed ideas to make our fitness center stand out. The more we worked on it, the more our bond strengthened. We were a team again. We also met with Alex, laying down clear guidelines for our professional relationship. While he was initially resistant, he understood that our united front was non-negotiable. Late one night, as we pored over design layouts, Sarah looked up at me. Thank you, Dave, for believing in this, in us. I smiled, taking her hand. We're in this together. The fitness center, our shared dream, became the anchor that pulled us out of our stormy seas. It was a symbol of our renewed commitment to each other. And as we work towards its launch, we realize that while the path of love is never smooth, navigating it together makes it worth the journey. The Fallout Revive Fitness was shaping up to be a formidable venture. Every brick, every machine, every advertisement bore testimony to Sarah's vision and our combined efforts. With our grand opening just a few weeks away, the pressure was mounting. One morning, as I was scouring local papers for any mention of our center, an article caught my eye. It was in the business section, a feature on upcoming fitness ventures in the city. Eagerly, I began to read, expecting a positive mention of Revive Fitness. Instead, what I found was a scathing critique. The article hinted at mismanagement, questionable financial dealings, and even made veiled insinuations about Sarah's relationship with Alex. My blood boiled. Sarah, I shouted, waving the paper. She came running, worry lines evident on her face. As she skimmed the article, her face turned a shade paler. This is sabotage, she whispered. We both knew who was behind it. Alex. Despite our attempts to keep things professional, it was clear he was unhappy with our united front, perhaps seeing it as a threat to his role in the venture. We had to act, and fast. Negative publicity like this could spell the end for our fledgling business before it even began. We need to address this publicly, I said, determination filling me. Clear our names and set the record straight. Sarah nodded. A press conference. Let's invite all major media outlets and put forth our side of the story. Over the next two days, our home turned into a war room. We gathered evidence of our business dealings, our financial statements, everything that could prove the allegations false. The day of the press conference arrived. The room was packed with reporters, their cameras flashing. The hum of whispers filled the room as Sarah and I took our places at the podium. We've called this press conference to address the false allegations made against us and our business, Sarah began, her voice steady. For the next hour, we presented our evidence, refuting every claim made in the damaging article. The audience watched, rapt, as we laid out the truth. As the conference concluded, reporters swarmed us with questions. It was evident the tide was turning in our favor. 
That evening, as the story of our press conference made headlines, my phone buzzed with a message. It was from Alex. Meet me. We need to talk. The next day, at a quiet park, I faced Alex. Why, Alex? I asked, anger evident in my voice. Why try to sabotage us? Alex looked down, guilt and regret evident on his face. I felt sidelined, replaced. When you two united, I felt my role diminish. I overreacted. I'm sorry. His apology, though sincere, couldn't undo the damage he'd inflicted. You need to make it right, Alex. Publicly. He nodded, understanding the gravity of his actions. Over the next week, Alex gave several interviews, retracting his statements and apologizing for his role in the smear campaign. The public, always eager for a redemption story, lapped it up. However, the trust was broken. Sarah and I decided to buy out Alex's share in the venture, parting ways professionally. The fallout from the controversy made one thing clear. In business and in life, trust is fragile. And once shattered, it's a long road to recovery. The Rejection I was going over the guest list for the grand launch of Revive Fitness when my phone buzzed. An unknown number, but the message was clear. Meet me at the park near the fountain. Midnight. There's something you should know. A chill ran down my spine. Who could this be, and what did they want to tell me? The clock seemed to move slower that evening, every tick echoing with the weight of anticipation. When midnight finally approached, I made my way to the park. The moonlight painted everything in a soft, ghostly hue. I could see a silhouette near the fountain, and as I drew closer, I recognized Natalie, Sarah's best friend. Dave, she began, her voice shaky. There's something you need to know. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. Go on, I urged. She looked me straight in the eyes. That article about Revive, the accusations. Sarah knew. She didn't orchestrate it, but she knew it was coming out. She thought it would create buzz for the center. I felt a rush of emotions, betrayal, disbelief, anger. Why would she? I murmured, trying to make sense of it. Natalie wiped away a tear. Pressure, desperation. She thought any publicity would help. My heart was heavy as I walked back home. The walls of our house, which once echoed with love and laughter, now felt cold and distant. The next morning, I faced Sarah. My voice trembled. Did you know about the article, Sarah? Her reaction said it all. She looked away, guilt evident. I thought it would help, Dave. I never realized the consequences. I could feel a chasm growing between us. You risked our reputation, our trust, for what? A moment in the spotlight? Tears streamed down her face. I'm so sorry, Dave. I messed up. But the damage was done. I need space, I said, my voice breaking. I need to figure things out. She reached out, but I pulled away. The house, our relationship, everything felt different. The following days were a blur. The grand opening of Revive Fitness was a success, but my personal life was falling apart. Sarah tried to reach out, her messages filled with regret and longing, but every word was a painful reminder of the trust we had lost. I had always imagined we'd face life's challenges together, but now, I wasn't so sure. The betrayal had left a scar, and I didn't know if it would ever heal. The days blurred into a somber gray monotony, each morning tainted by the residue of last night's disputes. Our house, once a sanctuary of shared dreams and passions, now felt like a cold war zone. Every conversation seemed to walk a tightrope, every silence pregnant with unsaid words. One day, a familiar melody danced into the room. It was our song, the one that played on our first date. The nostalgia gripped me, and a flood of memories washed over. Memories of brighter, happier days. Suddenly, the door creaked open. Sarah stood there, a flicker of hope in her eyes, holding a small box. Dave, she whispered, her voice quivering. I found this. It's the mixtape you made me when we first met. I thought, maybe, if we listened to it together, it might remind us of why we fell in love in the first place. My heart wrenched, but I felt the walls I had built over time were too thick to penetrate now. Sarah, I began, my voice firm yet gentle. 
There were so many beautiful moments, but the pain, it's too much. I can't just forget and move on. She took a deep breath, her fingers nervously playing with the edges of the box. We can try therapy, counseling, anything, Dave. I believe we can get through this. The sincerity in her voice was evident, but the raw wounds of betrayal and the shadows of the past weighed heavily on me. Sarah, I responded, a lump in my throat. I can't live in the what ifs and maybes. I've tried, but every time I look into your eyes, all I see is the pain we've inflicted on each other. Tears threatened to spill from her eyes. Dave, I'm begging you, give us another chance. We've been through so much together. I felt a deep sadness. It was clear she still clung to the hope that love could conquer all, but reality had shown me differently. I wish I could, Sarah, but the trust, once shattered, is impossible to mend, at least for me. The atmosphere grew heavy, the silence between us widening like an abyss. Sarah finally nodded, her tears breaking free. If that's what you truly feel, she whispered, her voice breaking, then I guess there's nothing more to say. I stood at a crossroads, torn between the pain of the past and the faint hope of a possible future with Sarah. Her eyes searched mine, desperate for an answer. But in this moment of uncertainty, I turn to you. Should I give our love another chance, or is the pain too much to bear? What would you do?